Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm Cy Schubert. Um, I ended up uh, sharing this because of my big mouth, so. Uh, I suggested that we uh, talk about uh, uh, swap states management in one of the working groups. And a week later, I got this email saying that each of us was still here right out. So, uh, I think Mark Johnson wanted to be involved with this as well. I don't know if you You're Mark Todd. Great. And your your uh, your student can do the oh, great. look up to my uh, uh, okay. Either that or we're video streaming as well. So okay, because either way, his his GSOC project is actually related to your yeah. class four point eight. Yeah. So uh, so, might have to so and I'll I'll rely heavily on you to since you know this uh, this topic inside and out. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's done a lot more work with the previous VM system than I have. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have any any very specific thoughts about any of these. I mean, I agree that they all yeah. they all kind of make sense as general enhancements. Yeah, and, and uh, certainly having having multiple tiers of swap devices and something that we could use and trim for and something else. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I, I stole all the time. What exactly is the project? Or it's a swap space uh, management uh, enhancement. Yeah, basically, having a any device that can basically behave as a, as a compressed memory disk. Uh, so essentially, it's just a backing store for swaps that happens to compress. Yeah. It's okay. so similar than what I was talking to you about last year. Okay. Yeah, I don't think what that was. Okay. Hacker Lounge, fine. Hmm. But it sounds a lot similar to what I was thinking. Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> Not just something that attaches on the side, attaching on the side. Well, yeah. so anyhow, this came about. Uh, um, I was, for me personally, it came about as I was doing some Git GC um, to to clean up my Git repositories. And I added a swap, so I added uh, added some swap, but this was on. Yet another device, and I ended up thrashing my my main my main drive on my my laptop. So the um, the, the idea I had originally was that if uh, if we could add some swap space you know, with with priority, such that we would use um, you know one swap device or a number of swap devices prior you know before we we. Uh, Use uh, say our lower priority devices such as such as uh, say Linux does, that would solve that problem. And uh, since we all already have a, a Google Summer of Code um, a project to uh, add uh, compressed swap, or not compressed swap, but uh, compressed memory, which is swap as well. I know. I mean, so it, like, you could take it pretty far, right? I think yeah. the intent is to do something like what um, Linux calls uh, uh, ZRAM, which yeah. is yeah, basically yeah, similar to a yeah. block device that you can you can yeah. use as a swap device. Um, it's not actually backed by by uh, like any physical media; it's yeah. just compressed and blocked on the fly. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, it's it's not the same sort of thing as like kind of idle memory compaction or something yeah. like that, which I think Mac OS does fairly aggressively. Yeah. Um, well, that's also a swap because you can't really use the memory until it's un uncompressed, right? Right. Uh, but I mean, I think the idea is to do it more proactively there. So, yeah. so in our case, we only swap in reaction to memory pressure, right? Yes. If you have a lot of free memory and, and there's nothing demanding, or there, there's nothing forcing the amount of free memory to drop below a certain threshold, we'll never swap. Yeah. Um, so, you so you know if, if you compress unused memory in advance, you can potentially uh, Avoid memory pressure in the first place mm -hmm. just by making your, your core free changes larger. So I think what uh, what Pavel is planning to work on is is not not this proactive approach, but rather just uh, compressing when when there's memory pressure, which yeah. I think is a, is a pretty good first step. Well, it's sort of like what we did on the mainframe in that uh, when we would swap or page swap would go to its own swap files or swap data sets, and paging would go to its own. But uh, we uh, initially uh, Send pages out to what was what is known as eStore, and eStore was RAM, but it's slower RAM than 
you know, RAM that you'd execute programs on. Right? And so that's kind of the idea that I have is that uh, if we compress swap uh, or compress memory, we're actually swapping out to uh, either a device that's a RAM disk, which is compressed, mm -hmm. or some other mechanism, which is uh, not device based, but internal to the server. So, so. Or, um, okay. It sounds like there's a oh, good one. my mic cause feedback. My bad. Ah. So is this Warner? Yeah. Yeah, this is Warner. I'm doing so we can talk about the deadly parts that you want okay. to talk so, about. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the uh, um, uh, implementation of swap priority and uh, trim space uh, or, or trim, uh, 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 trim support. And um, my idea was to, to uh, add a new uh, system call called nswap or nswap on, similar to what we've done with, uh, with uh, mount and mount. And uh, that would, uh, we would pass to it a, a structure which contained a priority and your trim support bits. So uh, I don't know whether that's controversial or not, but. Uh, uh, or whether anybody has any ideas. I mean, but those are my ideas, uh, as opposed to um, uh, to uh, patching the uh, uh, swap on system call, which might make it uh, incompatible with existing applications. I think we might call it. Yeah, I, I would just add a, a new a new system call and convert everything to use that. Yeah, which is what. Yeah, yeah. which is what. Uh, and, and the uh, the additional arguments. Would, uh, do I have it actually in here? Um, this, that's the eight. Uh, and uh, I just did the man pages. I haven't done any. Uh, so the. So the end swap on the man page would change such that we'd uh, support uh, a struct, and the struct would, as I said, would contain uh, a priority and uh, a trim support bit. So I mean, it, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. That's pretty straightforward. There's not really nothing else to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, so I mean, the, the way we do. Like when you have multiple swap devices configured, I think today we just do a blind round robin. Yeah. Um, there's like a global, there's a global mutex yeah. and a point source says an element of the swap device list, and we just advance that every time mm -hmm. you do an allocation. So uh, I, I think uh, it should be like the, the interface seems pretty straightforward. We want to have like additional flag bits so that you can you can attach additional functionality if you want. So like you might want to do things like. Have a swap bit device specific block allocation yeah. strategy. So right yeah. now we always try to do a next bit thing where mm -hmm. there's a cursor yep. for the for the last allocated swap block. So we always try to uh, allocate uh, to the next one. Right. So that that helps on rotating media because you you end up doing uh, a lot more sequential writes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was thinking of doing the same thing, except of all the uh, devices with that same priority that we're working at, and right. then when we fill those, we uh, we move to the next. Uh, lower priority devices. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there, there are some things to think about there, right? You, you can, like, you can you can come up with a situation where um, a low priority swap device. There, so so we fill up the high priority swap device and flush flush some pages to the low priority swap device, but then those pages end up getting accessed quite frequently. So yes. If space becomes available on the higher priority swap device. Do we have any strategies for recognizing that situation and migrating um, migrating? Frequently access blocks to a yeah. higher priority swap device. It's a good question. Um, yeah. So, I mean, right now, you know, if, if you, if you dirty some pages once and then access them many times, the, that kind of situation can, can arise pretty easily. We don't really have. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about what sort of entry point to detect that condition and potentially reflush the. Uh, the and would that, would that be uh, something that could be controlled with CTL? Uh, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, 
costs such that uh, uh, we, we detect that condition at a certain threshold. So right. we set the threshold to assist CPL. Right, so if we if we access the same loss, yeah. say more than n times, then you might want to attempt to promote that. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. I, I don't have a lot of thoughts on that myself, but it's, it's something that's worth considering, or it's like making sure that we, we have some way of, of coming up with a policy. Yeah, I haven't really thought a lot about this either myself, because I just said, it was something yeah. I blurted out on the uh, on the, the mailing list, and uh, here we are. Um, the one the one suggestion I have for the in swap on syscall is that you specify a size of the structure or a version of the structure or something like that, so that in the future, if maybe there's a right zero thing or there's uh, some combination of options that we have anticipated today, we could. You know, we could go ahead and add them somehow. Okay. That sounds fair enough. Like, it's, so, so you said Linux supports uh, prioritized. They, they, they right? support that. Yes. So they, they have like a numeric priority to yep. each device. Yeah, and the the uh, the default priority for the four devices is uh, a minus one, uh, minus one, uh -huh. and a minus one is default, and then anything higher than negative one. Okay. Uh, uh, that gets a greater priority. Now, I was thinking of either a zero to <clears throat> you know, a sixteen-bit max. Sure. I'm just wondering if, if it makes sense to do something like, oh, if, if you have a, an SSD, yeah, a way to treat that as a higher priority than, than a rotating. That system. and that that could be uh, just baked into the kernel, right? Right. Uh, and possibly even through a sysctl, such a or 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 a boot time uh, uh, boot time. Environment variable, yeah. Right? yeah, I'm just wondering, like, again, I, uh, I I don't know what Linux really does here, but I, I it's, 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 it's pretty simple, actually. It's, okay. it's just a, uh, all, they, all they do is they have a, a priority from minus one to 16-bit uh, max. Mm -hmm. okay. And, um, and uh, minus one is your default. Right. Now, I was also thinking of, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, the priority, uh, Using negative numbers, so it's such that your your default would be zero, and if you wanted to add lower priority devices, you could you could make them uh, a negative or have a default of somewhere in the middle, you know, say somewhere around uh, eight thousand ninety-two or or whatever. So I hadn't thought, hadn't thought about that much, but in, in addition to having priority, have you thought? Um, whether it's appropriate to add um, new mode domain support as well. If you've got a number of different devices, each of different domains, it has memory that's local to that domain, it might make sense to choose those to swap out preferentially for jobs in that domain, but maybe not for jobs not in that domain. And that might not be encompassed by a single number. That, that sounds like a good idea. I, I haven't thought about that. I mean, that, that's kind of difficult with the way the swap pager works right now, because it, it creates, uh, like it, it pages out in clusters of multiple pages um, that, are, that are adjacent in the, in the backing VM object. So if you have a disk, um, or if you, if you have a, sorry, if you allocated a region of memory that's, say, 32K pages um, aligned on a 32K boundary, the swap pager will allocate one sort of logical swap block for those 32 pages, which might not come from the same domain. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a bit of a, a bit of a mismatch at a few layers that if, if, if you try to do something like that correctly, um, if <clears throat> if you know in advance that all the pages in a block belong to the same domain, then you can do that sort of thing. But I wouldn't. I, I don't know if it makes sense to to support that as like a hard policy, like requiring that pages always get swapped out to a local domain. Um, just because, again, I think that would. Yeah, the, 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 the notion I have would be to enable it so that you could use it if it was appropriate. Right. Um, and be able to flag that I want this device preferentially to do only things in this new domain or try to do things in this new domain because I'm giving a swap device for each of the new domains or something. You would be able to do that, and the swap pager could potentially be modified to 
preferentially do things a little better uh, with regard to human domains. Right. It's kind of a long way off now. It's not a, an easy jump, but yeah. it might be something we want to consider I, in the future. Although high performance and Numa and Swap probably aren't three things you have in the same breath together. No. I mean, with with you know, with high speed SSDs, um, swapping is, is I think less less expensive than, than it used to be. Um, but my, my point earlier was just that like if, if you sort of require a policy. Like like what you just described, and you can you can get a lot of fragmentation because um, if you, if you have you know a region of memory that's that's kind of out, has has pages allocated using a round robin policy, then alternating pages are going to come from different domains, and you try to page out a cluster, well, you're going to have to start writing uh, start writing these these pages to different uh, um, different swap devices potentially. So it's I, I think it's it's something worth worth thinking about, but I, I wouldn't necessarily try to present a user interface for it yet. You might want to come up with a few simple kernel policies that it can try to apply, but it maybe make it a sort of soft uh, um, soft policy and that like it, it, it'll do the best it can, but it won't necessarily line everything up. Uh, possibly controllable to a, a CCKL. Yeah, I, I also think it makes sense to have like a version version number in the, in the structure so that yeah. we can describe it easily. Um, well, that, that, yeah, that's easy to go. Right? Yeah. So, so, but that's 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 my initial take on the version uh, on the structure, um, and then uh, let's see, you had uh, shim support, which is you know, we see that in the in the structure. Uh, this is similar to to uh, what Linux does, um, either. Uh, um, trim at the first, you know, when the swap data set is opened, or the swap uh, device is opened, or always trim. So whenever it deletes uh, or, or, or uh, uh, removes uh, pages from from swap, it would uh, trim those on SSD devices. Right. Does that make any sense? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, swapping the whole partition when you when you first open the device is yeah. pretty straightforward, obviously. Yeah. Um, so doing it on on so yeah, my my only real thought is that if you trim after swap lock is free, you want to do that asynchronously. Yeah, um, obviously, and, and I think you want to try pretty hard to coalesce uh, uh, adjacent ranges so that you don't end up issuing a lot of small sw trim requests. Yes, yeah. um, so that requires a certain amount of extra tracking and the, and the uh, swap feature. Yeah, in principle, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so, like right now, when we use we use a radius tree in memory to, to track swap block swap block allocation. Um, so now, instead of marking those blocks free as soon as they are free, you would probably add the freed range to some other data structure, like some sort of range tree, yeah. um, and then signal a thread, which at some point decides to actually issue trims for the. Asynchronously, yeah. right. maybe a separate kernel thread. Yeah, yeah. So you might have something like one task queue per. I mean, I don't know how UFS does it. I think there's like one task queue thread per per mount or something like that. Um, that uh, UFS, when it frees it, it schedules the trim and then it just processes the uh, uh, completion uh, task queue because it completes in weird places. Yeah. The the other thing you need to consider too is some devices are ill suited. For trimming, and uh, there, there's some performance considerations you might need to to do with that as well if you're wanting to trim the swap space as you go. So, would that be uh, something we'd want to do in a quirk then? Uh, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Would we want to Would we want to have some kind of quirk for for those types of devices as we discover them? Um, I don't know if we want to quirk for the devices because there's a lot of them that have performance issues. Mm -hmm. More a you know just kind of a recognition that if you turn this on, um, it might be really slow and it might affect your ability to read and write from the device. Um, NVMe drives range from trim is great and wonderful to trim totally sucks um, in different ways. So we just I'm just concerned that we need to. Uh, 
understand that because it's not always going to be the right solution for people to do. Oh, maybe just a man page uh, warning. Which I do is at your own peril. Right. I mean, yeah, it might just not make sense to automatically configure trim if, if, if the device supports it. Because, uh, I mean, elsewhere we, we have to explicitly configure it. In, like, at least that's, that's as far as my understanding goes. Like with UFS and ZFS, we don't trim unless the administrator specifically configures. Yeah. Configures. Is there any questions about Well, we're pointing out that it can actually cause more performance issues. Oh. So that seems like a reasonable argument in favor of not automatically configuring trim, or at least again putting assist controllers in a role that has yeah. space. Well, this would be you, you turn you, you set the bits to actually turn it off. So right. by by default, it's off. Right, and I presume that that's also what Linux does. In this. Yes, that's exactly. So like what you always does. have to configure trim. Yeah, you always have to configure. Yes. Okay. So, and that that pretty really much covers what Linux does. The default off is a good default. Default use it if the device supports it is probably not a good default. Yeah, yeah. So, and just put a, a warning in the man page to say that uh, uh, to to use this at your own peril. Right. Okay. Uh, works for me. Okay. Is anybody keeping notes here? Because I'm not. No. Okay. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll I'll try to put something together after the after this and maybe send it to to uh, Mark and to Warner to. Uh, to Make sure I got it right. So, uh, the next one I have uh, on here, I can't see, is um, enhancing Dev D to support um, adding a swap device. So, what I had in mind here was um, once uh, if if the if the uh, uh, amount of free memory. Um, is, is below a certain threshold, and we trigger an event in Dev D to um, allocate more swap. So Dev D really becomes more or less a, an event manager. An event occurs such that we uh, we have uh, um, a memory a memory low condition, and uh, uh, Dev D runs some commands. And it's essentially. Essentially, Debbie, Debbie, go ahead. Uh, Debbie is really good about reporting information in the kernel. You have transitions below, you have transitions above. Um, yeah. We use that for uh, other things elsewhere. Um, as long as we're not gating the something in the, you know, using it as a callback to user land to call back into the kernel. Yeah. As long as we're not gating it there, it's just a fire and forget sort of thing. I think that would work really well. So would that uh, would that uh, cause any problem? adding swap because now no, you're, no you're, I don't think it'll cause any problem at all sorry to interrupt but are you sure the, the hangout is actually live because I was saying that you can't oh. it. and it's uh it should be <clears throat> yeah the, the only thing that he's not good at is a high rate delivery system so as long as it's a relatively low rate and it's then it'll work really well. If you're doing it several times a second at that, those rates it starts to fall behind. Hmm. Yeah, well, that was basically my idea of, uh, of just enhancing the ID to, to support that, you know, just for this one instance. So uh, 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 the, the threshold would be, uh, would be uh, managed through a, a sysctl. Um, Say 80% full by default. So if your your swap is 80% full, it would uh, uh, trigger a sysctl. So do you want to take a look at that? Yeah, because this, 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 this is the first time I've done this with with, uh, with Hangouts. So okay. Warner can also show you this one since it's been on the board. Pardon me. Hey Warner, can you share this meet link for others? Warner? Yeah, I need to unmute to talk. Uh, yeah, I'm sharing it right now. Thanks. You might be asked to prompt for people to join 
same way with caveat. Yep. Okay. So any any thoughts about uh, uh, any other thoughts about uh, DFD and uh, and uh, the threshold specifically, and what thresholds would we want to to uh, to uh, uh, consider, such as the, uh, the the amount of free memory or percentage free. <clears throat> I mean, per cent is probably the better idea. Pardon me? That's per cent. Yeah, percentage made sense to me, but. Uh, um, Sorry, like to, for triggering an event. Yeah, to, to trigger an event, I was thinking at 80%. Right? Once once you're 80%, you, you don't want to trigger the event when you're totally full and, the, and uh, you're scrambling for space and, and killing off processes, right? Sure. But yeah, there, there's some sort of. Um, there's watermarks in the swap pager itself yeah. that cause it to block messages and become yeah. full. Um, I, I think it's pretty easy. So I mean, it's, it's a bit difficult, right? Because your swap space can become fragmented. Yeah. So you can have issues where you actually have quite a bit of free swap space, but you don't have enough contiguous swap yeah. space in order to page out those uh, equations. Um, so I think you do try to fill those holes as, as best you can, but. Don't know that we can rely like like it, it, that's just worth taking into account when you're when you're triggering events, right? Um, you might not be able to do much better than oh hey a, a swap out or a page out failed for for lack of contiguous free swap space, so now I have to trigger an event. Uh, Should we consider uh, um, you know defragmenting swap space as well? Uh, sure. I mean, doing that at that point is. Um, it, it, it's hard to say in general, right? I mean, there, there, there could be situations where that where that helps a lot. Um, I think you could identify um, fragmentation pretty easily, um, just because within a given object, you can kind of look at its its tree of allocated swap blocks and identify places where um, uh, there, there is multiple holes. Yeah, I don't know how much how much of an issue that would be in practice. Um, it's just one that I, I, I consider thinking about when, when designing a threshold. Okay, um, and then our uh, final one is swap the memory. Which is um, memory compression. Uh, so, Pavel, are you are you on the call? Maybe. Really, uh, Pavel. Pavel. I can see, but I can't hear. Uh, Warner, you can hear, right? Warner, audio is working. So I added the swap to, to, to uh, memory or memory compression only because it's related to this, and um, it would it, it would affect our uh, our um, implementation of this either way, right? And that's just another swap device for that matter. Yeah, as far as I know, that's that's the initial plan. Um, again, creating creating another MD yeah. device type that is like yeah is is backed by by RAM rather than by and that could be a higher priority device, almost like a, a, a cache, right? Right. Um, okay, it sounds better. 
Can you hear it all, Pablo? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the sound from the room is bad. Right. We're good. Oh. Yeah, for the warning. <laughs> Uh, I can tell. Um, yeah, I, I can. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for him, but okay. I, I don't have that much to say again. Myself, we, we, the, the project hasn't really started yet, uh, but I, I think that's the general idea. You can, you can specify this uh, memory compression device, and you give it some, some limit on the amount of RAM it can consume itself, and then potentially have a fallback SSD as a second tier swap device, and then large HDD is, is your product to respond to this. And what Linux does is they actually create a, a memory device which is not pageable. So right. it's not pageable, and then they swap to that. Right. And if they want to compress it, they just turn on compression on the device. Uh, so you just layer a, a compression on top of the device. Right. I think that's that's effectively what that brand is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think the, the, the proposal for the project is to create something yeah. akin to that. Um, kind of like an MD device. Yeah. And so it's, it's like another it's another back end. It's another back end MD device that is not backed by, or that cannot be uh, paged out or swapped out. Right. And uh, and then you just uh, layer, uh, say, some kind of like compression device on top of that. Or, right. And that, that was what that was the idea I had, but uh, similar to what we had with uh, on my, like my my background is the IBM mainframe, and uh, we would uh, send pages out to what is known as eStore, which is uh, slower RAM than RAM, and uh, as uh, as um, pages would age in eStore, they would actually get sent to the to to swap. So eStore was kind of like a, a cache. Does that make any sense? Right. But is, is there any, is, like, what kind of provision do you have for making sure that the most frequently accessed swap or page out blocks stay in the, in the fastest memory? We would have to have some type of uh, mechanism to, uh, to right. age them, just like we do in, uh, in RAM, right? Right. So, I mean, is that. Whereas with RAM, with RAM, you have the, the, the page, uh, uh, the, the page, the, you know, the, uh, um, the access bit in, in the page table. Right. In, the, in, the, in the case of, uh, of uh, swap, you don't really need that. You can actually uh, assign a, uh, a last access time to that, uh, to that uh, entry in the, in the uh, table. Right. Right. And uh, if, if, you, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you want to uh, Decide which which the which uh, pages to to uh, send out to uh, to uh, lower lower priority devices. Then it's just a matter of scanning for pages that are older than M, right? Right. As long as you have the the uh, timestamp in there as, as to when they were last accessed. Now, when pages are brought in from from swap, are they actually aren't they removed from swap or do they remain up there? No, they, they stay, like, so a copy, like when, when, you, when you page back in, the page is clean with respect to its batch and storage. If something then writes to it, then the page is dirty, and then the swap space can be free. Okay. But, so that's that's why I gave the example before of an, an application that, that dirties the page once, yeah. causes it to be swapped out, but then never writes to it again. Yeah. Um, so it's like some, some computed data that gets cached. Um, and if it's swapped, if it's page back in, uh, and if, they, if it's no longer needed, it just gets removed. It does, yeah. So because it's already written out, right? So I think you you need you need some policy to either proactively or lazily promote frequently accessed swap blocks to a higher priority device yeah. when, when space is available. So it might not like you know pro proactively scanning might be prohibitively expensive, um, but I think you know in that um, you could on access, check to see if there's sufficient space available in the higher priority swap device, and try copying the block there instead, 
Well, if, 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 the, if the, the page exists, you know, if it's on a lower priority device, never, never uh, reference it again, right. then why even move it? Well, that's the thing. So on reference is yeah. when you make that decision, yeah. right? Um, so you could add a counter for, for the number of references that you want to see before you make a spike decision. You, you have to embed some policy into yeah. that. Um, but I suspect because, you know, small devices can be potentially quite large relative to, uh, to, to the amount of system memory there. Well, at that point, what you would do is you would uh, delete it from the old swap device, and then if it needs to be paged back out again, right. it would select the highest priority device that is available. So you wouldn't have to move them, mm -hmm. you just delete it. Yeah, so that, that, that would be an example. Yeah. So then you just, you just remove its entry uh, in, in the, uh, you know, on the swap device. And right. then, you know, mark the page. You mark it as available, and the next time you, you, uh, uh, you uh, page it back out again, right. it selects the, the highest priority device. Right. But, I mean, there's downsides to doing that too, right? Because if, if your highest priority device is consistently full, then yeah. you'll end up keeping, you, you, you'll, you'll mark the page dirty again, reclaim its swap space. But yeah. then, in order to reclaim it in the future, you'll have to write it back out to the swap device. So you're yeah. potentially doing more I.O. than you need to. So, yeah. um, so there's, you know, there's a few trade-offs to think about, and it's probably workload specific. Um, but, um, I mean, as a, as a first cut, not, not thinking about these problems at all, or at least, you know, trying to implement a simple lazy policy, like, yeah, again, uh, uh, free, free swap blocks after a reference if there's space available on the highest priority swap device. That, that might be a sensible policy. Or, or would it make sense to do what Linux does, which is uh, when a swap device is full, just move on to the next one and not worry about uh, uh, about uh, moving uh, pages back to a higher priority swap device. Yeah, I mean, if, if that's what that, they that's do, a, then that's a simpler approach and it's uh, oh, sure. a lot less overhead. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's all it's about actually having a prioritized swap device. Yeah. It's just you know you just you, you just build a higher priority device first and, right. and uh, um, yeah in that in that case then uh, um, yeah you wouldn't really need to move anything unless you uh, you do a, unless you delete uh, delete the, the uh, page off the the uh, device it came from and at that point it would move so right. so it seems that that would be a simpler way of, uh, of implementing it. And would uh, would um, uh, swap to memory be a higher priority? I guess that would have to be. I think that's that's the idea. Yeah, because yeah. uh, you you don't have to do any I/O to swap to it. Um, it's just compression. Under yeah, under under memory pressure, you'd be able to do page outs to that device, like pseudo device, more quickly. Yeah. What would your so what would um, have a, what would uh, too bad we can't uh, ask him. But what would his idea of, uh, uh, let's say, for example, the uh, uh, the uh, memory would be, uh, you know, constrained? So you uh, never. Let's say, for example, memory is full, mm -hmm. and you're about to start killing off processes. So mm -hmm. uh, reducing the size of the in-memory swap device in order to uh, to um, Deal with that condition because you know you're already using some memory for swap, right. and you're in a situation where OOM is now being invoked. Do you want to uh, um, to uh, start moving some of those pages out to physical <coughs> disk, to SSD, or to spinning disk, and start reducing the amount of space that your uh, your uh, Memory compression is. I think that would be that would be an optional feature, right? Like you don't necessarily need to do that in order to have a, a useful implementation. Um, for for situations like that, yeah, you might want to keep a reserve of free pages yeah. available in the in the compression device, and then you can yeah. uncompress pages before writing them back out to yeah. uh, uh, to stable storage. Um, but I mean, in a situation where, well, I suppose it wouldn't matter because you're still uh, at, at that point if you're in an OM situation, you're you're able to swap everywhere, right? Right. So yeah. So I mean, there's, there's, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. So it, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I don't think you'd have to you'd have to really deal with that problem to provide a useful solution. Yeah, Jeff. Well, that covers everything I wanted to cover. So, does anyone in the room have any opinions on previous use for law policy? Whether you whether it has any perceived shortcomings or anything like that. Well, I have seen that some of the issues that have uh, uh, come up have forced us to move those up. So we're going to leave it to some other sponsors and other stuff that I can't do other than we said it. But I think that uh, uh, it might not be a So what happens that goes on the first conflict, like uh, if you like your own supply law, mm -hmm. and you see that get small for this pool, mm -hmm. and try to log in via console, and uh, you try to send a call to this, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. The only workaround is try to reset button or get to reset button. Mm -hmm. and so it's basically well, so in that situation, previously you should try to pull a process or a series from memory, right? There are uh, right. It kills yeah. the greatest one, right? Um, I think it. I think that's basically the heuristic it uses. Like it, it looks at resident memory in particular, and uh, so it, it tries to quickly get a sense of uh, which process has the largest resident size. Uh, the problem. The one problem with the way it works is it's very strict in that <clears throat> if FreeBSD is able to reclaim any memory, even a single page, the sort of state machine that decides, okay, I'm going to kill a process, reset. So if, if there's some some mechanism by which a trickle of clean pages is, is available, so if, even if you're only able to reclaim, say, one page every every second, which is not really enough to, to understand <coughs> certain, we won't we won't trigger it all until. So I think there are some known, I, I, I personally think that that policy is, is a bit too strict, and that's the main reason for, for that decision, right? Because presumably, in, in your situation, unless there's a kernel memory leak, the kernel should be able to find the process to kill it and right. un, un like itself. Um, so it's, it's worth knowing if, like, if, if, you have a, if you have a workload that, that consistently reproduces that, it's, it's worth reporting it, I think. You do hear about these things. Yeah, see, I, can, I can trigger an OLM at will on right. this laptop. If I don't have enough swap and I do a hit GC on the ports uh, tree. Yeah. But that means the kernel uh, it, works. It, right? it, uh, I, I'll, I'll lose something. Could right. be my could be, uh, could be X, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. but I, will, I will lose something. So I, I do have to add swap to an 8 gig machine in order for a git GC to work. Right. So, yeah, I mean, in, in that case, the kernel's functioning more or less. Yeah, it's, 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 right? it, it, it does work. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I've never been able to, to reproduce those kinds of issues myself, but my instinct based on reports like this, which are pretty hard to confirm, is that we're a bit too conservative about deciding to OLM once swap is exhausted. It's not happening very often. No, no. Or after once a month, and you're right there, please, you can't change it. Is it done? Which version is it? 11.2. But it happened before on 10.3 as well. Right? So well, you've done a lot of work on uh, on uh, on PM since like 12 at least. Well, the OM policy hasn't really changed all that much in the past. I think I think Caustic rewrote it in maybe 2013, 2014. And even before that, I don't think it's it's changed all that much. Again, if, if we're able to reclaim clean pages from anywhere in the system, yeah. um, we'll we'll avoid uh, performing an OLM. So, so in practice, actually, that's not really that's not really sufficient, right? Because again, if, if you can reclaim pages at a very low rate, then we'll just get stuck. Um, and then there's situations I think where that can happen um, if there's some. 
like if there if there's a few free pages bouncing around through through the the buffer class or something like that, I think it's possible to that not to worry. Everything's frozen, but the OM shorter doesn't kick in. Um, so I, I don't really I haven't thought a lot about how how properly to fix that yet, but uh, but I think it is it is a known issue. A lot of the issues I have uh, with uh, with um, uh, I'm not sure whether it's whether it's related to our VM system or what yet is uh, certain ports like uh, you know take take any of the, one of those tarballs and extract them. It'll uh, use up all of the RAM. Sometimes it'll go from the OOM. ZFS or uh, it's using ZFS, yes. And so if I issue, if I'm replacing <coughs> BSD tar in uh, you know in make.com, so then in, in, uh, for, for the port, so replace, uh, setting the tar environment variable to to be tar G tar resolves the problem. But it's uh, BSD tar that uh, that uh, will use up all of RAM. Weird. I don't know yeah. why that would be. I'll try to I'll try to uh, recreate it this uh, this week and show it to you. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about yeah. the. I mean, presumably, if you do something like limit the size of the arc, yeah, uh, you, you'll, you'll avoid that problem. Um, I don't know. Well, when 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 the arc when uh, when the uh, problem does occur, the arc is down to about. One uh, one uh, one gigabyte. Uh, so it actually the, the arc actually does give up its uh, its uh, uh, its memory. Because you get a lot of those anyway. Yeah. But it's only certain tarballs that do that. Not everyone. Have you reported that on the models already, or? Oh, I haven't. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's probably worth looking. I'll try to recreate it and then report it. So, okay, well. Question. So, I mean, we're trying to avoid swapping at all of our device because they are very limited in a disk space. And at the moment, the only reason why we use the thread partition is that we need a kernel dump. You know what to do in the swap file? The kernel dump? No, it has to be a raw device. But um, you can, you don't have to. You don't have to configure a partition as a as a swap device in order to use it as a dump device. You no. can create a like. Um, there there might be some some logic in the RC scripts that automatically take partitions of type FreeBSD swap and, and uh, make them make them be swap devices. But that that that's just a policy. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay. It's just the common. It's just a common configuration, right? Because as soon as you can, it, all the space in your swap partition is you can just say nothing more, just create a kernel dump there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if if you want to avoid using a swap device entirely, there's no reason you have to do that in order to use in order to make kernel dump. Okay, and where do I write the kernel dump there? Sorry. And so where is the kernel dump then writing to? Or well, I mean, it, it'll write to the, the quote unquote swap partition, but. Yeah. The kernel is not instructed to swap to that partition as well. So there, there are two sort of uh, two logically independent mm -hmm. devices, effectively. Oh, well, yeah, just that it has to, it just wants to write to a swap partition that even has swaps in it. Oh, so it is. Oh, no, that's not something that's yeah. um, So if we can get a kernel dump in that state, or at least put you can drop into DVD. Well, I think that pretty much closes us off, and I'll uh, make up some notes. And, uh, oh, oh, all right. No, it's okay. 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 We I, have to okay. okay. I'm just looking to get a kernel off of that. So, so many folks. Thank you. So, Warner. Hello, Warner. Yes, he's uh, on the ice. Warner, can you hear us? Yeah, I've been having trouble okay. hearing for the last few minutes. Uh, so I just started adding Warner and struggled to get back. So I, I, I haven't been taking any notes, so I'm going to try to do as, 
uh, jot down a few notes of uh, what we talked about today and then send them to, to Mark and yourself to review to make sure I haven't missed anything. Does that sound okay? Yeah, I just lost the audio. <coughs> Well, I'll jot down some notes and uh, send them send them out uh, um, before we post them up on the uh, on the, the wiki. Then, so, do you have anything to add, to Kirk? Uh, no, I was looking just curious. Yeah, I haven't looked at squat in probably fifteen years. Yeah, I'm sure things are going, but it. Uh, I just suggested this on the mailing list. Uh, I just when it was just when it hit, hit me that I uh, you know where and I suggested this and uh, and then a week later I think it was uh, um, who sent it, it was, uh, Gordon sent me an email saying that I'm sharing this so <laughs> teaches me to yeah say so, something you know I mean for years we spent a lot of time working on squat because we were running on machines with yeah. four megabytes of memory yeah. And, Swapping a lot, we had to really pay really close yeah. attention. And, and you know, in today's world, the swap is kind of an afterthought because people want to see the back. So, well, I found that since the last uh, uh, changes to um, was was the last Numa and VM work that you did, um, I'm using a little more swap, but that's fine because uh, the Arc is now using it because the Arc would not touch. Uh, it would not uh, go beyond, say, three and a half gigs, but now it goes to about 4.8. I do a little bit of use a little bit of swap, but that those uh, those pages are never swapped back in. So I'm actually using the memory that I paid for. That's what I see. Right? So I paid for eight gigs. I'm actually using it rather than uh, have uh, say you know three or four hundred uh, megs of uh, of uh, memory used for. Know, something that I never, uh, I never reference again. <coughs> so, yeah, the so I think that I think it's optimal as far as I can see. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the intent of the laundry queue work that we did a couple of years ago yeah. or a few years ago was to, yeah, to, to more precisely identify rarely, rarely accessed certain yeah. pages, so that we, we hopefully take longer to swap out pages, but we're more confident that the pages that do get swapped out are unlikely to be accessed. Which, which is what I've noticed. I thought uh, since uh, since uh, the last uh, commits to uh, to the VM subsystem, I, I've noticed that uh, there was uh, it's been a great improvement. Um, there, there are a lot of problems though in the way the arc interacts with the swap. Well, so ideally the arc would get merged in the buffer cache, like every it other. It should. Uh, yeah. Um, so that turns out to be a bigger, a, a, big, a hard problem, especially if you want to. Yeah. I think it's I think it makes sense to do to, to, to treat the arc as an analog of the buffer cache and then in the same sort of way fill out like instead of using as much memory as possible for the arc cache, a fixed size, say half a gram, and then it takes pages from the arc into the into the LRE like the, the page queue. That's something I've thought about doing. And I think that's a bit easier than kind of wholesale converting. CFS and, and web servers is not going to be added very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and the, the other problem I was going to gonna describe is that, well, you decide to swap based on the amount of memory that's reclaimed from the Canadian queue. So, uh, so clean anonymous memory, um, pages that were evicted from the buffer cache, and so on. But the page daemon has no knowledge of, of how many pages are being freed directly from the arc. So there is no sort of signaling mechanism that says, um, okay, we're, we're releasing lots of pages from the arc, so we don't need to swap in order to reclaim it. It's more that two subsystems are kind of making the same decision at the same time and don't, don't necessarily do that. No communication, yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, integrating with the page cache. Yeah, which I actually think using set OS uh, no, I don't think so. I think they, they do more or less the same thing that, or they 
work well. So now they're integrated to, they're yeah. not even better integrated with that. I, I mean, I think they have, I, I think the arc is hooked into the kernel's memory management scheme a bit better than Linux and did things a bit too well. Yeah, that's the question. I, I don't know exactly what the details about it. I mean, I know they still have some sort of separate arc and it's not unified in the case not in the whole, which is, and, and that might work better for, for UMA's. In FreeBSD, I think we've done quite a lot of work to make UMA and We've done a lot of work to optimize the page data and, and reclaim pages from those resources. And so now we have this third yeah. that, that's not integrated. Not so. We could try and port the back pressure mechanism that Linux uses, but I think that, that, that kind of defeats a lot of the, the work that we've done already. Um, so I'm looking for, for having a page data reclaim pages from a different yard or having some sort of accounting role on Linux. It was a possibility. Yeah. Okay. I guess we're done. Yeah. So I'll write up some notes and send them off to uh, Mark and Warner. That up on all my machines, including my old laptop, which is uh, well, I've got eight gig on that one. The old one's got two gig. Yeah, well, that's that was the reason I didn't put. Yeah, and and I had that up. I only had the four gig when I bought the laptop, so I thought, oh, I will put ZFS on here until I add more memory. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And that's how I ended up discovering that dump. Right. As a matter of fact, I ran ZFS on the old laptop and it only had 768 bytes. I, I had an unpleasant experience. Uh, our hosting provider stuck us on a VM for one of the machines I'm taking care of. Yeah. And he just said, oh, ZFS, that's what all the cool FreeBSD guys are on, right? Yeah. So he put me in on and, and gave me four megabytes of RAM or four, four gigs. Four gigs, yeah. Uh, yeah, four gigs of, of, of RAM. And that machine used to go up and down like a yoga because the arc was. Uh, oh, but what you do is you just limit the arc. That's what I know. I, I had to finally limit the arc. Yeah, that's what I did. I limited the arc on, yeah, yeah. on the old machine and it worked. Perfectly. Yeah, it's just that it would be nice if it uh, stayed nicer with the. Uh, I think it does now. Yeah, it does now. Uh, I know that. I know, like, I, I've been following some of that being done. That's why I just kind of had this bad. Uh, I just didn't want to play with ZFS on my laptop and don't have more memory. Well, you can do it. I can do it now. I can do it now. I've got 16. Yeah. You know, that's what, that's what I'm asking. And that's how I ended up. And, 
because it took me so much time setting up that laptop because I had uh, partitions on, on for Windows. I didn't want to lose my work. So I was going to dump the whole thing, and it went into the core. Hmm. Yeah, I, it was dumping like a 300 gig uh, uh, FreeBSD partition. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I had, uh, so there was a problem with dumping. That's how it all happened. And I haven't switched to the ZFS yet, so I should. That's... Uh, it's sort of good. I only document with the bug. It's not my bug. You did well. I mean, I, I wasn't sure if anybody was recording that or not. Well, I hope, hopefully, this records it because if it does, I'll play it back yeah. and then I'll make my notes. Yeah, that's cool. So, uh, I was wondering, you know, why we couldn't just take one of the, the, uh, the heck does it call it? Take a G, put a G disk, like a uh, virtual disk, you know, like a G mirror, you know, have it be accurate. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. So, you know, create a, a disk. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, you create a a memory with the yeah. NFS, yeah. Okay. Yeah. but it's not paged out, yeah. and then you run a, 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 a GL compression yeah. layer on top, of it, yeah. which is exactly what Linux does. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. That's, 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 that's what Linux does. That's why I was wondering why we just didn't yeah. do that. Yeah. I mean, we can play with it also. Just that's, that's, what, uh, that's what Linux does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we could do the flatbed thing, except we add the bits to the machine. Well, I'll keep in touch with, uh, with Mark if you want to. Just email him, and then uh, when Pavel does his work, if he's going to be doing a, a Google Summer of Code thing for this, so uh, why not? But, uh, but uh, I, I think that's probably the simplest thing to do is what Linux does, which is you just create a device and you put a yeah, yeah. Is it, can you do that with MD control? Yeah. No, like the, where, where it's, it's non pageable? Because that's what you might have to add a bit. Because you don't, you know, if it is pageable, that means you're sending it out to, to your, your Geom device, and then it gets sent out to swap, the real swap. Well, I think, so you don't want that. Yes. You want you, you want that. Uh, that uh, memory just not to be paged. Over the Christmas break, uh, I think it's I think it should be possible. To do gonna have the that. Thing on you. And if not, then you just uh, you know, add, a bit, add, add, add a bit to the kernel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, Brian, Actually, you could because you already have you got the system bit, right? If you turn on the system bit for that process, right? Or non-pageable, or you can already write the two bread. It was good enough. So, no, the system bit means that you can't kill it. So, all you have to be able to do is kill it. Like, uh, if you, uh, um, I think there's a non pageable bit. If you turn that on. Why would you not be able to page it? Surely the uh, Aeon layer could take the, the raw compressed disk and say, oh, you want block offset and dub it on the raw, and it's compressed, so I know it's only at block such and such an offset, whatever. Inside of here, I just uncompress it. Suddenly have the real block block at the offset. Well, which is like the way they work. Yeah. Of course, there was the only networking that was dialogue. But I'm not a geek. But, uh, well, as much of a geek as anyone else is. Like yeah. Propeller head. Uh, I can't change my stuff. I just have to make sure. I'm going to make some notes and wait for whoever runs this thing here and then uh, them, uh, 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 I'd like to see the Yeah, the Geom, I 
intelligence in that context is because there hasn't been primarily. We've got, you know, seven or eight independents on the team every time over there uh, to speak to. And you know, they, what, you know, what's going to happen when those people die or you know, retire or whatever is that many of these you know, human to be taken over by the corporation to become corporate entirely. You pretty much would have known about that. So, I, I like to think that you know, the, the GSPs are kind of like mammals, and maybe the dinosaurs, and sooner or later, maybe they're going to hit the earth and land because they go to the <laughs> We'll see where that goes. But, uh, so I, I left the team staff, and, uh, and so it just goes back to the team and how things are going. And eventually, you know, I wanted to be involved, so I would take three good leaders to take the ability to do the base and not work hard on the team. But most of the I'm never going to run this board. Um, I got drafted into the Honest and Whiskey Foundation board, but my goal there is to make sure that the board of the flag gets off. Maybe it's the foundation is going to be out of the project, you know, not run the project. Um, so uh, I, I've actually sort of watched how the Honest and Free Whiskey first started. Or was uh, decision for life. Uh, and so what ended up happening was that the core just kept slowly growing. And people would kind of burn out, but they wouldn't step away because you know, they didn't want to be the trustee for three months or blah, blah, blah. And so, especially in volunteer projects, you just have a natural kind of cycle after you know, 12 years of just plugging it. And you just have to get rid of Something that you know, structurally doesn't have a real problem. So um, the trick was to figure out how to somehow get these funds that were going in core, and you know, core isn't quite self-selected, and you know, those are the buddies got to be core, et cetera. So how do we fix that? So some of us got together um, in the late 90s and decided, well, what we do is we'll create a set of bylaws for the Call, call. And doing that was uh, something to disruption. We already had to make it up to the core. So that structure doesn't have to work in full time. So we said, well, let's make core a weapon. And you know, this is a event to prevent complete outsiders from coming in or getting self out. We just said, you have to be clear in order to but of course, to get the marriage in place, we had to get core that voted in. And you know, the, especially the Jesuit board didn't want to see the anyway decision. So, but I took advantage of the fact that you know, the, the base is for Jesuit. It's kind of not really paying much attention to it. Well, uh -huh. I want to get these bylaws in place here. They're going to move over to market core. But of course, um, you know, anyone that's already on board is grandfathered in. And we decided you know, we should have a nominating committee. But in a lot of cases, the nominating committee doesn't by itself wield a great deal of power. They pick you know, the nine you know, blessed people and they appear on the ballot as you know, nominated by the nominating committee, et cetera. So I wanted to avoid all that. So the nominating committee is actually not even in the bylaws. But um, the idea being their role was to make sure that at least nine people were on the board of doing that. But once they make sure that nine people are running, then they stand back. So there's no report, there's no indication that you know, these people were nominated or that they were nominated or anything like that. Um, and uh, you know, there's no, nothing where you've got to get the signatures of some huge number of people to run. Like, if you're a committer, you can just raise your hand and get them to run. Um, so, uh, anyway, after the first two years, you know, the first two years, election at all. Uh, but then after two years, it's time for our first election to happen. And so I was part of the nominating committee. So when the nominating committee wants to turn out that court, well, you're going to run for the next 
side. Uh, you were grandfathered into the first term, but now I have. How many of those people to this day will not talk to me because I trick them? Mm -hmm. But if you act it, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the election came around and I five of the original people got elected and then some of the people came in. Since then, there's been no problem.